Hi, Marcos. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi. So with Marcos and now our customer, Accentra, we keep staying in the manufacturing industry. So, but uh, it's a bit different use case, a bit a different approach on how to, to do things in the presentation we saw before. Uh, Accentra is a really innovative company implementing business intelligence solutions or uh, software. And what they're doing is they build their own products, but they use Flowable within their, at least one of the products, right? Uh, let's see if exactly. we can do more for the future as well, right, Marcus? Yeah. And in today's presentation, I think the name is How Maintaining a Process-Driven Digital Twin Drives Smart Manufacturing. Quite interesting name, so I'm excited to hear what you will tell us about that. So we will listen what a digital twin is and how Flowable is supporting you guys in managing that in the manufacturing process, right? Totally. So I don't want to talk too much, right? I want to give you, I want to hand over to you, Marcus. I think you're the showman here, right? To, you can guide us through the session today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fabio. I want to talk to you about a process-driven digital twin, which means I will present you a concept on how to maintain a digital twin and what kind of business value will come out of it. So maybe you've heard about the buzzword digital twin. And it, in my opinion, it really is a buzzword because every white paper, every company, every software understands something completely different. What should an actual digital twin be? And I tried to figure out the definition. And I started with Gartner and they say a digital twin is a technology enabled proxy that mirrors the state of a thing. So that would mean that I have some kind of digital thing that works as a proxy of a real thing. So in my opinion, maybe that's a little bit too, too less. So I want to, to, to add something to it. And I want to say that in our manufacturing domain, we will have a thing, a digital thing, a digital twin that mirrors the state and the history of the product, the process and the resource. And this is something that um, you find also in the, in the literature. So for example, here we have this paper that I find very much um, fitting for what we are talking here. And you see here that the whole physical asset is defined by product process and resources. And on top of this, we have the digital twin that mirrors the state of my real thing. So it's now very abstract, very theoretical. Let's try to put this a little bit more into our business domain. But first of all, I want to, to emphasize that we have, um, that we do not have to reinvent what a digital twin is, that we do not have to reinvent what a thing is and what an image is, that there have been people before us who aren't even computer scientists or who have no clue about manufacturing and they have made a lot of thoughts into what a representation is. And one of the biggest takeaways out of this is the object is simple. And I want to keep this in mind for the whole talk that the object is simple. So we shouldn't fear about this big word digital twin. We should be um, very, very satisfied with having just a very simple object. Imagine just maybe the, the coffee cup that's in front of you and try to find out how we can derive a digital twin from the information that we have. And of course, because we're here at the Flowfest, the information that comes from the processes. And that's the key takeaway that I want you to give. Now let's start with the manufacturing problem of the ancient Greeks. Yeah, you might wonder what do the ancient Greeks have to do with manufacturing? Well, they build a ship. They have built a ship and there was a king and this king is called Theseus. And he has, he has had a very, very great ship. And through time, this ship has been replaced partly. So something uh, broke off, something uh, had to be replaced and he replaced everything. He replaced um, the, the, the steering wheel, he replaced the planks. And over time, is it the same ship? 
what's the ship? Is it actually the same thing? Is it still the ship of Theseus? And this problem uh, was very, very prominent for the philosophers. And I would say, well, if they would have had a process engine, they would have known it. Because if every part that they replaced would have went through a process engine, then they would know, well, it's still the same ship and they are still able to define the digital twin of the ship because every change that has been made can now be reflected to what we call the digital twin. And basically that's also what we do in manufacturing. So we have processes and those processes change the actual thing. And as soon as we are able to listen on those processes, we then can derive the needed information to augment our digital twin and to build it. And what kind of business will we come out of this? So let's just assume for a moment we have this. And now I'm asking why. And I have three points that I think are very interesting. Um, first of all, the data is product centric. So that means that the data is linked to the actual product. So imagine your Excel file that's somewhere on a share. And for example, is telling you how much the individual parts of your product um, cost. Now you don't have this linked to your parts. It's the actual, it's the Excel file on the share and there is no direct connection with a digital twin that is process driven. You have this directly linked. Also the digital thread is maintained. So what could be a digital thread? It's the history of something. So let's just assume you are testing, for example, your product and one part fails. And now you see, oh, that's the part that we redesigned just three weeks ago. And that was manufactured in a hurry. And now it broke because you, if you know the digital thread, you can derive it out of your processes. So regarding what you see in your digital twin, you know it's past and you know how the past could have influenced the present state. And then you have the digital shadow of something, which is what the real world basically augments. So for example, you can say uh, you have now this part, you have several parts that have failed in the test and you are now wondering may, what, what could be the reason for it. And then you can make the decision, well, maybe we should um, test better or we should plan more time to test or we should plan more time to simulate because what we found out out of the digital shadow is that as soon as we don't have that much time and that if we don't plan that much time we do not succeed we cannot deliver good quality so these are business values that you can take out immediately when having a digital twin and then let's think about a future so Let's just assume we have this digital thread, we have this digital shadow, we have the digital twin, we have the processes, the data readily available. What can we do with it? And what could be a business value that we still can um, leverage? And the first thing would be machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we could predict and simulate scenarios. So um, the more data we have, and in my opinion, the, the best data comes out of the processes, the better we can train our machine uh, learned our, our models to do predictions and simulations. What can we do on a second future business value? We can build a knowledge hub. So we can learn from the past problems and solutions. So if all our incidents are mapped to the digital twin, because our digital twin is process driven, then we might learn that we have very particular problems with, for example, um, this sub module in our product or with this kind of robot in our assembly line. And we can learn from it and we can see how we have solved the problems before because the data is still readily available. And the third big future business value would be to be able to do a retrospective. So if something fails, if you have a quality issue, then it's not just guessing. You have this digital thread and you can 
pick up all the steps from the past and see and understand why something has happened and it will help you solve the problem. Now let me talk about real world use cases because we have implemented, we have successfully implemented digital twins in several scenarios. And I want to, yeah, to lay out the most important of them that we have implemented in the last, let's say five to six years and also with a uh, flowable in the center. So one would be cost tracking. So you would imagine what could this be? Let's assume we have the digital twin of a product and we want to answer the simple question, how much is the product? What's the internal manufacturing costs of the product? And if you think of the automotive domain, then configuration is a very big thing. So no vehicle is similar or equal to another. There is a lot of um, variants in it. And in order to understand what the costs of a concrete um, prototype of, of a concrete buildable um, vehicle is, we are able to listen on the changes that occur in the allocation and in the finance department of the automotive uh, company and augment the data that we have here to our digital twin. So we have the process running and while the process is running, while the business process is running, we derive the data that's coming out of it and augment it to our digital twin. So that's the use case of cost tracking. And we now know exactly how expensive our products are. The second use case would be to understand if a given configuration is buildable or if a prototype is actually valid. So if you are manufacturing, you might know that some combinations of parts are not working out or that if you are, um, that some combinations of parts simply do not make sense. And in order to validate this, we are also defining those processes with BPMN and then triggering the validation out of it. So let's assume we have this process. Well, there is a new, uh, a new um, bill of material coming in and now we want to validate it. And in order to validate it, we use BPMN and we uh, send with BPMN the bill of materials to a simulation and validation process. Then the, the result comes back and then we can augment this result to our digital twin. And we actually know if our product is valid and billable. And we do this for two customers. The next thing would be, the next use case, the third of four that I want to present you is the test vehicle management. So you can imagine if you need to test your manufactured products, you want to um, test a lot of things with it. You want to do reuse. You want also to protocol and document everything. But the most important thing, you always need to know what's inside your test vehicle. Because if you um, rebuild it in the workshop and if you change the parts and if you um, substitute some assemblies with test assemblies or with prototypes, you always want to have this reflected to the actual digital twin. So what we do here is we manage all the processes that change parts on the digital, on the real vehicle. We listen on the bomb relevant information on the processes. So Flowable will say, well, this part has been changed. And then we listen on this task, on this user task, what's happening here. And we then derive this information and map it back to a historized bill of material. So we then know exactly what the test vehicle looks like, feels like. So remember the definition from earlier, we completely mirror the state of the product of the test vehicle that we have. And we are doing this for an agricultural machinery OEM. And um, this is very much flowable centric. 
The last use case that I want to present is a project that we are doing together with Continental and with uh, the FAPS Institute at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen Nürnberg, because we said, why? Why don't we try to make everything process driven? So that's a very, very big, um, big idea that we have. We want to build everything from the start of the engineering of an assembly line to the AOL of the assembly line with PPMN, with Flowable. And we want to derive every information that we have starting from the engineering process, the, the ERP process, maybe even the customer relationship management, the project management, project controlling, the engineering process, up to the IoT events that will eventually come out of the robots and build everything in BPMN and then derive a 100% precise digital twin of the whole factory, not only for the IoT stuff, but also for the engineering and organizational, the management part of the whole endeavor. And this is a, quite a big project. We are doing this now in the, I think in the second of four to five years. And we made a great progress. And we also have Flowable here as the central process engine. So now that we've seen the use cases, I want to dive into how we could implement it. So what are the next steps? What should we do if we want to build a process driven digital twin. And it's basically this. We will have a process engine, Flowable, as the orchestration platform. This normally runs in a cloud infrastructure. We are using Kubernetes for it, but it could also be um, a web application server. Uh, it doesn't matter. And we will have the business processes that come from the actual idea up to testing and verification inside of Flowable. So we implement them with cases and we implement them with BPMN. And every time something is relevant for a digital twin, the Flowable process engine will send a message to an event broker. This could be a Kafka or an ActiveMQ. And then we build with separate services, the digital twin. So the, the foundation of everything is the end-to-end -end modeled business process. The business process then exactly knows when something happens that's relevant to the digital twin. Then we listen on this information and augment this information to the data we already have in a historized database. So we not only know the current state, we also re remember the digital threat. We also know the past and the history of our product and the, of our machines. So that's basically the reference architecture that we have implemented and successfully implemented and it works. And to go a little bit down the rabbit hole, um, what the best practice could be in this case, I want to share this with you as well, is that we are using the process driven approach, PDA, which basically means that we have a very, very strict separation between the business processes and the implementation layer. And this is some of the key findings and some of the key takeaways that I want to share with you, that if you want to implement a uh, process-driven digital twin that you need to separate the integration from the actual business, from the business processes, because both parts are very, very agile. They can change a lot. Uh, interfaces will change. Um, specifications will change. There, you always have the problem, the systems come and go, and you always have the challenge that the business processes should change because you want to improve, you want to get better. And in order to do this without, without having actually a very glued together system that is interdependent on each other, we need to separate it. 
So there comes a very big business value in regarding of in regards of maintainability and flexibility, agility, if we separate the integration layer from the actual business layer and we do this with open source technologies, with great um, standards, with uh, REST, with JDBC, if we need to integrate into a database and as an event broker, remember the information that we derive from the processes to build the digital twin. We are putting everything into a Kafka and then the Kafka uh, events are also um, quite resilient and uh, we can replay them. And with those events, we then eventually built the digital twin. Also, one of the biggest takeaways I want to share with you is that there comes a very big business value out of the GraphQL, because what we have seen is that um, REST is too clumsy and too big, too inflexible to manage big data, because we're talking about about big data here and GraphQL enables us to do this in a very, very um, efficient and singular way. So to uh, summarize, this is how we want to, or how we do implement a process driven digital twin by listening on the events that happen on a business process level, sending them to a Kafka and then deriving a digital twin out of it. If you want to uh, learn more, more about this, I would like to recommend our bi-weekly German podcast that I'm doing together with my colleague Lucas. And also the last, um, the last episode is about digital twins. So it might be quite interesting as an addition to the talk that I've given just now. Cool. Thank you very much, Marcus. <laughs> I think it was uh, yeah really exciting to hear <clears throat> what you are doing with your customers, right? And uh, and we saw already a lot of use cases, right? But uh, what uh, I mean, you are actually expanding in different directions already. So it's it's really interesting to see that. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, we already got some questions also from the audience. So uh -huh. maybe we're gonna start there uh, with a few of them. Um, I think one question is uh, how long did the development take, so to say, to bring the first solution live? Yes, um, I think you have to um, make um, to do some big wait between doing a greenfield solution and integrating into an existing solution. So if there is a lot of integration work to do that we have experienced with uh, one of our customers, we are talking about at least one to two years. If there is the possibility to, to do a complete greenfield implementation, it can be done in like 12 months. From start of defining the processes to the actual rollout of the software. No, that's, that's also quite, uh, quite uh, special. Yeah, it's, it's, it's doable in a very agile way because uh, as you all know, Flowable, does not define the processes at compile time, you can change them in runtime, which makes it very, very easy to adapt to changes and to work in an agile way. Cool. Um, yeah, you mentioned a few customers. I think when someone from the audience uh, is wondering if there is anything else just for imagination, every other customer you're able to mention, so to say, which is using the solution already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are working in, the, the prototype uh, phase mm -hmm. of German OEMs, but I can say mm -hmm. that we are basically working for, let's say three out of the five big German OEMs. Cool. I think that's, that's fair. And I think it's also fair to, to be uh, correct there. Right? Yeah. And uh, another question is, I mean, you mentioned already three use cases, right? Uh, are there other are there other more use cases planned with Flowable? Yes, uh, we plan more use cases, especially where we are currently relying on a legacy code that is um, basically glued uh, very much and very not that generic. And we want 
in all the places where we do refactoring and where we are um, based on business processes, we want to do the switch to flowable. Cool. Uh, another question is about uh, the cloud, so to say. I mean, is your stack cloud native? I mean, is it also scalable? I mean, what, maybe you can mention a bit about that. I mean, you mentioned big data, so I assume uh, yeah, scalability is a topic, right? Yeah. So um, cloud native is a very, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big topic. So let's start with the services that are building the digital twin. They are cloud native. So we are using uh, mostly Quarkus here, the cloud native Java environment. We are using Kafka, which is basically cloud native by design. Mm -hmm. And we are also using several cloud native databases that, yeah, the ones that you already know, like Elasticsearch, Mongo, and so on. Uh, regarding the, the process engine, we deploy them, we deploy flowable in Kubernetes and it works out quite well. But I think until now it doesn't meet yet all the criteria that we need to be 100% cloud native, uh, yet it works. So yes, we deploy cloud into the cloud into a Kubernetes. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned big data, maybe let's continue there, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, are you also integrating with a data warehouse? I mean, how does this connection work mm -hmm. together? The good, the good thing with uh, with Flowable is that we can consume data from any kind of um, of service that we have. So our pattern usually, as you remember, the very um, the, the the separation of the integration mm -hmm. and the actual business. That's something that is very strict in our company because we want to have it. We have we want to have clean code, and that is why we normally implement a um, a ambassador service for each of the data sources that we have. So if you mention big data, we are using, for example, Databricks. It's the Apache Spark um, uh, software as a service that runs on AWS. We are also very much integrating into Apache and uh, not Apache into SAP HANA database, not as for the database. We are also having a lot of um, events on the Kafka, and we are using our own big data database that we call ADS, which offers the mentioned auto historization of the um, product data, which is very, very um, necessary to have a good digital twin. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, another question, I mean, I think it was not asked yet in all sessions. So that's why I think it's an interesting one. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you also using any artificial intelligence or machine learning framework for with Flowable? Or uh, yeah, are you already in this space? Yes, so we are in this space and we are integrating third-party software. So how can you, um, uh, how does this fit into the architecture? We write the ambassador service, the ambassador service then um, gets the the, um, the result or simulation or the, the estimate out of the uh, machine learning and then puts it into the process, for example, as a suggestion or as a hint so that the user task can be um, can be done in a more efficient or in a more in a better way. But yet it's not that it's um, steering the task. It's just a kind of suggestion or a help. Okay. Um, yeah, I think legacy is always a topic. That's why I think also cust like our customers or let's say audience interested in legacy tools. So I think uh, one question is a bit like about business events that are not caused by, let's say, really by legacy. Are you also integrating mm. those and how are you doing that, right? Yes. Um, yeah, we are doing it because mm, the world is not perfect. Um, we've made good experience with Apache Camel. So even if we, even if we have, for example, a, a Oracle database, um, something like Apache Camel helps us to listen on changes there to do some kind of eager polling and maybe not so nice things on a technical level, but it works. So yes, it's 
the brown field always is difficult, but you can um, somehow use tools like um, Apache Camel to uh, basically work around it. Cool. And then uh, the last question, I think it's always uh, an interesting question, right? I mean, if you need to mention one benefit, what would be the benefit you would mention to use Flowbill in your solution? Um, maintainability and agility. We can change the uh, processes very fast. We can uh, implement in a very efficient way, which wouldn't be possible with um, plain Java, with plain Angular or React. And um, it stays maintainable because of the service-oriented architecture that Flowable 100% supports. Cool. So I think it was, uh, again, a very interesting session. So I think it's uh, it's nice to support you guys in this journey with our product. And I see that there is a lot still around uh, our product built, which is uh, also quite interesting to see how our product is, let's say, extended to the limit with big data, with different integrations and stuff like this. So thank you very much, Marcus, to be here. And thank to you to have the opportunity to speak here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cool. So I guess we're going to have now a half an hour break. Oh, no, a 20 minutes break. Sorry, 20 minutes break. And then we will continue with our next uh, session here. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you.